Okay, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 16 through 20. It's called the role of Jeremiah. Uh, God speaks to us through his word. Through Jeremiah, he says, As for you, God speaking to Jeremiah, do not pray for this people or lift up a cry or prayer for them and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Do you not see what they are doing in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers kindle fire, and the women knead dough to make cakes for the queen of heaven. And they pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. Is it I whom they, is it I whom they provoke, declares the Lord? Is it not themselves to their own shame? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my anger and my wrath will be poured out on this place upon man and beast, upon the trees of the field and the fruit of the ground. It will burn and not be quenched. Now, let me just give you a little bit of background of our text here. In this chapter, Jeremiah is sent to the very gate of the temple itself, the central place of worship for the children of Israel, the place where the presence of God resides, and he is instructed to proclaim the word of the Lord concerning the behaviors of the people of God that had come there to worship. What is taking place there that God sent him to, to send him to speak words to wor of correction towards this people, what is taking place is that to the people of God, the temple itself somehow became a guarantee to them of, of their blessedness, of the blessedness of the city. And the problem with that was there was no concern for the ethical demands of the covenant that they had made with God. In other words, they were worshiping exterior, exterior forms of worship, but they were not keeping the covenant. They weren't uh, doing what they had agreed to do. They were worshiping other gods. They were uh, doing uh, uh, moral, their moral behavior was out of character with the, cover, with the covenant, but yet they still considered themselves to be blessed because they had the temple in their midst. The presence of a temple made with timber and stone in which ritual activities were performed could be no guarantee of the divine presence and protection when the people despised the moral demands of the covenant. Nothing less than a deep and radical repentance and a profound spiritual renewal would help to deliver the people from inevitable judgment, that is, from the operation of the curses of the covenant. Because with the covenant there were blessings, and with the covenant there came curses, right? Everybody wants the blessings, but no, and, and nobody wants the curses. The problem is, uh, it all depends on your response, how you behave towards the covenant itself. It was to that state of affairs that Jeremiah is sent to address the people. In this particular verses that we read, God is speaking to Jeremiah, and he tells Jeremiah not to pray for the people that he is speaking to through Jeremiah the prophet. He tells them in no uncertain terms, do not intercede for these people. And it says in verse 16, as for you, do not pray for this people, do not lift up a cry or prayer for them, and do not intercede with me, for I will not hear you. Now, on the flip side of that is that what we have a, a, an understanding here, and we're going to get to in a minute, is that God does hear the prayers of his people. Amen? But he's telling Jeremiah, don't you pray for these people because I basically I've had it and I don't want to hear you intercede for them because they've already set another course and charted another course for their lives. So in this text, pray, lift up, cry or prayer and intercede are an example of parallelism with some intensif intensification in the series. And for that reason, the three statements should be retained. Do not pray to me for these people don't cry or shout out to me in prayer and don't press me on their account or don't plead with me about them also the statement for i do i will not hear you may be rendered as i won't listen to you you may be surprised with that background in mind and the background of that text what i do want to bring out to you tonight it's not that god was upset with the people but basically what we're going to learn from this text is that jeremiah had more than one role. A lot of times when we think of, of a prophet, we think of a person that speaks the words of God to the people of God. But what we're going to find in this text is that uh, God, what God told Jeremiah not to do, we're going to extrapolate from that, and we're going to learn what prophets also do do. Okay? So, Let's look a little bit at, at the prophetic ministry back then in, in the Old Covenant, uh, in the words that Jeremiah was speaking uh, uh, to the people. Let's look at his role in that particular time. So first of all, what we need to realize is that a prophet was raised up by the Lord. For instance, Jeremiah 
uh, had the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, and God said, I want you to go speak my words to the people. So what we learn from that is that the prophet had a speaking ministry. In fact, in that text I just read to you, Jeremiah 1 and 5, God said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you to prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm only a youth, for to all whom I send you, you shall go. Wherever I command, whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And the Lord put out his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So another prophet by the name of Ezekiel, we also see in his book, Ezekiel 2, 4 through 5, when God revealed himself to him, God said the descendants also are impudent and stubborn in, in chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, or you shall speak to them, thus says the Lord God. And whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So what we see is that a prophet had a speaking ministry in the Old Testament, right? So there are two primary ways that a prophet brings forth the word of the Lord. One is they foretell. What does it mean to foretell? They declare how God uh, sees a certain situation, how God feels about what is happening. As in our text, God is telling Jeremiah, I'm not happy with these people. Look at what they're doing. They're worshiping other gods and they're bringing sacrifices and they don't live up to the covenant. And so what is God? You tell these people, basically, because of the way they're behaving, this is what's going to happen uh, and this is what I'm bringing upon them. So they forth tell. They tell what, where God is, where the people are in relationship to God. Uh, that's one of the things that they do. But not only do they forth tell, they also foretell. They speak things that God says in the future, this is what's going to happen. Now, many of the things that God foretells are, are conditional. In other words, if you keep behaving this way and you don't repent, you're going to come under judgment. However, it says in, for instance, 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 7, I think it's verse 15, it says, if my people will humble themselves and pray. Now, notice that's a big if, right? And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. So God is declaring, basically, this is a problem. You're, you're, you're heading for a, for a road that is not good. You're under judgment. However, if you will humble yourselves and pray, if you will do this, then I will change that pat pattern. I will change that path that you're on, and what I'm telling you won't happen in your midst. So prophets foretell what's about to happen, but many times the foretelling of the prophet is conditional. But those are the two primary ways that prophets speak. They can do it verbally, they can do it written, but the bottom line is they have the word of the Lord and they either foretell or they foretell. But that's not all that they do because there's a lot of people that think that that's all that a prophet does. But one of the reasons I, I focus on this text, I felt like the Lord was speaking to me through it, and we've done other teachings on this as well, but it's important that we understand that another function that our text reveals is that a prophet was also supposed to be an intercessor. Can you say that word with me? Intercession. You know what that means? A person who prays. And they're interceding uh, before the Lord on behalf of the people. What people? The people that they're, in this particular case, uh, Jeremiah is uh, giving forth words of judgment from the Lord because of their behavior. And so Jeremiah's role would be to declare the word of the Lord, but at the same time to come before the Lord and say, but God, don't do that. God, please have mercy on your people. God, this is not, this is not really what you want to do. Now, Please understand that it's not like God says, hey, man, I, I, need you to, I need you to just stay next to me because I can't control myself sometimes. That's not the way it is. God actually set up a system where God responds to the prayers of his people. And one of the things that God wanted his prophets to do is he wanted his prophets not just to have the word of the Lord, but he also wanted the prophets to have the heart of the Lord. God doesn't want to bring judgment on anybody. Right? But there's so many uh, uh, people throughout history, and we see it a lot today, that they have, and we're not saying that, they, it's very hard not to have the words of the Lord. There are some people that don't have the words of the Lord, but we'll get into this in a minute. But people have the words of the Lord, but they don't necessarily have the heart of the Lord. And so they'll speak the words of the Lord, but they'll never do anything to, uh, to, in, in, their own, uh, um, in their own behaviors. They'll, new, they'll never do anything to respond to that word with the heart of God. 
And so what would Jeremiah, based on our text, God says, whatever you do, don't pray for these people because I'm not going to listen to you. So what would a prophet normally do, a, a prophet that had the heart of God, a prophet would go to the Lord and say, no, God, don't do this. Please, Lord, have mercy on these people. And we can find this throughout Scripture. In fact, one of the people that we're going to look at here in a minute is we're going to look at, at, at Abraham. In fact, let's just jump there. Abraham was a prophet. And God came and he revealed himself. Three, the, the Bible says three men showed up at Abraham's tent and Abraham prepared a, a meal for them. And then as they were going on their way, uh, we come to recognize one one was the angel of the Lord, which is a pre-incarnate uh, uh, revelation of the Lord himself. And then you had two angels of God. And the Bible says that the angels went down to do what they were going to do. And the Lord remained standing and allowed Abraham to remain standing before him. And he had said before this, should we not tell Abraham what we're about to do? Now, what you need to realize is that God is, in saying that, in revealing his will, is inviting Abraham in to the counsel of God. Does he have to do that? No. Does he know what he's going to do? Yes. Does he know the future? Obviously. But he wants Abraham, who is a prophet of God, but also a friend of God, to enter into the counsel of God and have a part in what God's going to do in the next a uh, 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 few years, in the next few decades, in the next few moments. He wants Abraham to be a part of what God is doing. How many of you know that God wants us to be a part of what he's doing? Does he need us? No. Can he just do everything he wants by himself? Obviously, but he didn't create the world, and he didn't create us to, to just be robots functioning in a world in which we have no input. God actually designed us with the ability to shape our reality. He designed us with the ability to shape our lives and our culture because he gave us free will and the opportunity to respond to him and bring him into our lives, into our midst, into our church, and cooperating with God. God's obviously the one that's the instigator and the initiator of it all with the power and the authority we fall with him. But with God, we have the ability to change the status quo. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And Abraham, when he hears what God's going to do, you know what's happening, that they're going to come down, God reveals that, that Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, Gomorrah the, the evil and the wickedness that has been happening down there has come up before him, and now they're going to go check it out. And, and if it doesn't check out, or he thinks it's not going to check out, there's going to be judgment come upon them. And so what does Abraham do? Abraham, uh, he realizes, hey, this isn't good for, for Sodom and Gomorrah, and there's a problem, I have family members down there. Right? And so what does Abraham do? But I want you to know, it's not like God said, oh man, I wish I hadn't have told Abraham what I'm doing because now he's not going to leave me alone. No, that was actually the plan of God from the beginning. To reveal his words to Abraham so that Abraham could become what God wanted him to become, which is a person that was concerned about the society around him, someone who had the heart of God, and in not just have, uh, having the words of God, but the heart of God, then he could pass that down to the generations that were coming after him. You see, God, God doesn't just want us to pass down his word to the next generation, he also wants us to pass down his heart to the next generation. You know, you can have his words and not have his heart. You can have his heart and not have his words. What we want is we want to have his word and we want to have his heart as well. And so God is teaching Abraham, and so when he reveals this to Abraham, Abraham's thinking to himself, oh, my, my, my nephew Lot lives down there. And then all of a sudden he begins to intercede with God, and he said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? If there are 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? And God says, I will spare the city. If there are 45, will you spare the city? And God says, if there will be 45, I'm going to spare the city. But I want you to know that Abraham is not just a person that knows the will of God and has the words of God, but Abraham is demonstrating the heart of God by doing what prophetic people are supposed to do, interceding for the people around us. But how often, if we're not careful, we say, man, I sure hope God gets them, man. Those people, they don't know what they're doing. And, and man, I can't believe these wicked people live around. Hey, we used to be one of them. Aren't you glad that God saved us? 
Aren't you glad? It's, it's almost like we forget sometimes that, uh, but for the grace of God, there goeth I. God reached out to us by sending someone that had the heart of God to minister to us, and now God wants us to do the same. But what happens is we, we get all caught up in church, get all caught up learning the Word of God, and we forget that God's heart is for people that are lost. God's heart is for the world, These, this world that Christians are often so readily pronouncing judgment against. They're already under judgment God didn't come to condemn them God came to save them they're already under condemnation they don't need us to condemn them what they need us is to go out there intercede for them pray for them and reach them because they're lost and God doesn't want them to be lost are you hearing what I'm saying and so that's what Abraham began to do Abraham began to intercede with God and said God don't let this happen and you might think to yourself he got down to 10 and then all of a sudden uh, what good did it do because the city was uh, condemned anyway because there were not 10 righteous people but he didn't pray for one he didn't pray for two and he didn't pray for four but God knew his heart because Abraham had God's heart and so God went ahead and delivered his children his his son I mean his nephew and there and there and and, and and his daughters and and they was trying to, to to deliver his wife as well only she she looked back in other words she was so attached to that place and people actually think that she was born in that town and she couldn't let go and that's why she ended up uh, 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 coming under judgment because she wasn't willing to turn away from the world that was under under judgment are you, are you hearing what I'm saying and so Abraham did find favor with God and God uh, uh, interceded uh, uh, not only uh, went to went to bat Abraham went to bat with God but God went to bat for Abraham okay so then we have in the book of Exodus we have Moses and you know God God sent Moses it wasn't Moses that tried to deliver Israel God delivered Israel and he used Moses why were the Israelites coming out of uh, out of slavery because God's heart was to deliver them from bondage into the promised land so God sends a man by the name of Moses, and Moses, you know, you know the story, you read the Ten Commandments, you, you watched the Ten Commandments, you, you know Moses, uh, Charlton Heston, you know, let my people go. You know that, right? So anyway, they, uh, they pass through the Red Sea, go to the Mount of God. While they're at the Mount of God, Moses brings down the Ten Commandments, and God calls him to go back up again, and while he's back up again, he's up there for 40 days, and the people, uh, you know, I want you to know that sometimes when God is not talking to you it's not because God's not aware of your situation it's not because God doesn't know what's happening but oftentimes sometimes just like a parent will withdraw to see what their kids are gonna do when they're not being supervised sometimes God will just withdraw a little bit doesn't mean he doesn't know what's going on but he's just kinda saying what are they gonna do how are they gonna respond if they don't know if, if they think that somebody's not it's amazing how many people if they feel like they're not being watched they'll just go right back in to doing things they shouldn't do right and that's what happened to the Israelites they felt like they weren't being watched you know with this Moses we don't know what happened to him make us a God that'll go before us and and lead us into the promised land and so uh, they 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 had Aaron fashion for them a, a calf and it says in Exodus 32 30 through 32 uh, the next day Moses said to the people you have sinned a great sin and now I will go up to the Lord perhaps I can make atonement for your sin so Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Now, I want you to notice what Moses, a friend of God, but also a prophet of God, was doing. He, he knew what God's, God was going to do. There was going to come judgment. But what did Moses do in the face of this judgment? He went to intercede before the Lord that the judgment that he knew was coming, that God would relent. Now, are you, are you catching a picture of what I'm doing here? So far, I've given you a picture of people that are prophets, Old Testament prophets, that a lot of people today are trying to fashion themselves into the mold of an Old Testament prophet, only the people that God is fashioning into Old Testament prophets are a lot more compassionate in the Old Testament than a lot of the New Testament prophets. Abraham prayed, God, don't let this happen. Moses prayed, God, don't let this happen. The one prophet that wanted it to happen, God corrected by the name of Jonah. Remember Jonah? Right? What happened with Jonah? Uh, God said, I want you to go preach to Nineveh, and I want you to tell them that that judgment is coming. And Jonah said, nope, I'm going the other way. 
and he tried to run away from that. And you know the story. He got caught up in a storm. Uh, they threw him overboard, got swallowed by a whale, saw Pinocchio in there. No, that's not what happened. All right, so <laughs> got swallowed by a whale. While he was uh, in the midst of the whale, he cried out to the Lord, and that whale ended up, uh, we say it's a whale, but the Bible says it's a great fish, took him back to where he was supposed to be, actually spit him up on the shoreline close to that city that he was sent to, Nineveh. Right Now, I want you to know that the god of Nineveh was a giant fish. Did you know that? So this, anyway, he, here he is with the guts of a giant fish, you know, all over him. He's probably, his skin has probably uh, turned white because of the acid of the, of the fish that he was in. And there he shows up, and then he begins to proclaim, and I'm pretty sure that they figured out what happened to him, that in 30 days, you know, this, this is going to, we're going to be under judgment. And here's what happened. The people, when they heard this message, they repented. They repented. Okay, so that's a good thing, all right, for most people, but it wasn't a good thing for Jonah. It says in Jonah chapter 4, 1 and 2, it says, It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord, and he said, Oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was in my own country? That is why I, I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that your gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. In other words, I didn't want that. I didn't want you, so the last thing I wanted to do was to give you a word which would prick people's hearts and then pray for them so that they would turn. I didn't want that to happen. And then you know what happened? God went to work with Jonah. He caused a, 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 a plant to grow up over him. I think it's called a gourd, and it grew up over him in one day because it was so hot. And I would tell you, I was in Albuquerque, and it's not even summertime, and it's nice in the morning, but in the middle of the day, whoo! It is hot. It's desert out there, right? And so uh, if you don't have shade, you can, you can really, really get overheated really fast. So he's sitting out there looking over the city, uh, probably on an elevated place. God causes a plant to grow over him. And all of a sudden, Jeremiah, he begins to feel refreshed. He feels really good. Not because of what's happening with the city, but because of what God is doing in his life. Oh, thank you, God. You're so awesome. You're so merciful. You're a great God. And all of a sudden, that God sends a worm and kills a plant. And now Jer Jonah is bitter. Why? And God is saying, why are you upset about the plant? Well, I'm sure he's thinking to himself, well, the plant was beneficial. It, 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 you know, it, it was taking care of me. It provided me shade. And he said, you're concerned about a plant. You know, in other words, and listen to what he's doing. He's trying to teach Jonah his heart. He's trying to give Jonah his heart. He said, you're concerned about a plant that's here today and then it's gone tomorrow. He said, but what about in this city where there, I can't remember, there was 20,000 people, it may have been more than that, I can't remember the number right now, that they do not know their right hand from the left. In other words, don't you think that I'm concerned about them? Here you are concerned about a plant, and I'm concerned about them. And I want you to know, these people weren't part of the covenant people of Israel, but God still loved them. God still cared about them. And so what God is trying to teach us through these people in the Old Testament, and in, in, if, you, if you see yourself as an Old Testament prophet, Jonah was an incomplete Old Testament prophet, right? And God was trying to work with Jonah so he could mature him to become all he wanted to, him to be. But the job of the prophet in the Old Testament was to, yes, speak the words of God, but also to intercede on behalf of the people that God was sending them to. So they not just have the words, but they have the heart. Are we good? Are we good there? Okay? So, now let's go into the New Testament. And let's look at Jesus. And I want you to know that Jesus is a prophet. When Moses said there's going to come a prophet after me, and the people of God were always looking for this prophet, they thought it was John the Baptist, because in John chapter 1 it says, Are you the prophet who is to come? He said, No, I'm not the prophet who is to come. Who is the prophet that was to come? Jesus. Jesus is a prophet. Matthew 13, 57. Uh, they said, and they, when he was in the, in, in the city of Nazareth where he grew up, they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor and except, except in his hometown and in his own household. So he's quoting a proverb, but at the same time, he is recognizing and he's showing us that he was a prophet. Right? Okay. So what, what, what is the deal with this prophet? What does the, what is the, the Bible teach us about Jesus as a prophet? Well, first of all, we need you to know that Jesus had a heart, and his heart was a godly heart because he was God in the flesh. So what did his heart look like? 
John 3 and 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So what is His heart? Not to condemn, but to save. Right Now what about his words as a prophet? John 12, 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. So he had the Father's heart and he had the Father's words. Right? So the last thing I want you to see is that he also had a ministry of intercession. It says in Hebrews 7, 25, Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right? So what I want you to see is that you have the prophetic ministry in the, in the Old Testament. You have the prophetic ministry demonstrated through Christ. But I want you to know that in the New Testament, there is still prof pro prophetic ministry. A lot of people tend to feel like, well, that was all back, uh, you know, uh, in the Bible days. And, and um, if you, particularly if you grew up in an evangelical church, one of the teachings that's going around is that uh, when the perfect comes, there's no longer need of these gifts anymore. And they, they interpret the perfect to be when the Bible was written, and now that we have the Bible, you don't have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Uh, but I don't believe that the perfect was the written word of God. I believe when the perfect comes, it's talking about when Jesus comes back. All right? So until Jesus comes back, you still have prophetic ministry. In fact, Paul himself says, I desire above all else, I mean, no, he, he said, I did, uh, uh, earnestly seek after, zealously lust after uh, the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So the prophetic is still uh, working within the church. There are, in fact, if you read the pages of the New Testament, after Jesus died, buried, resurrected, you still have prophets in the New Testament. All right, in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, it says, There was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who we know as Paul. Right? It's very likely that before Paul was, had an apostolic gift that was, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, that was activated in his life, he probably functioned as a prophet, as a teacher. Okay? So in Acts 15, 32, it says, Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Okay, and then Acts 21, 8 through 10, on the next day we departed and came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven and we stayed with him and he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. Now it also says while we were staying with them for many days a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So we see in the pages of the New Testament you still had prophets, right? Now, what I want to let you know is that today, there's still prophets and there's still prophetic ministry. Okay? But my goal today is not to convince you of that. That's not really my goal. I really want to get to a place, what, what is the heart of prophetic ministry? What are they supposed to do? We're going to get there in a minute. But first, let me show you that according to the Word of God, I believe the Bible teaches that there's still prophetic ministry today. In Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, it says, He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until... We all, not some, not most, but we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love now he's speaking to the ephesians he's speaking to the ephesian church but i believe he is speaking to the body of christ at, at, at uh, in this world all throughout wherever there are born again christians wherever there are two or three gathering his name we're all part of the body of christ Okay, so what I'm trying to get you to realize is that there will be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints until we all attain to the unity of faith. Have we all attained to the unity of faith? No. Ha have we all reached the fullness of the, of the knowledge of the Son of God? Have we all reached mature manhood? Have we all grown to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ? Are we all no longer children? No. We're not. So if we're not 
then that must mean that God has still given to the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, right? And what we're focusing on today is prophetic ministry, but I don't just want to focus on prophetic ministry. What I'm trying to get you to understand is that these gifts that God has given to the church are not supposed to be superstars. They're not supposed to be the ones, you know, that, that do everything. They're sent like coaches to equip the body with what they've been given. They're supposed to, the grace that is on them, they're supposed to impart the bo- to, to the body so that the body can do what they can do. How do they do that? They do it through teaching. They do it through uh, equipping. They do it through example. They do it through, through, through activation. They do it through impartation. There's so many different ways that they do it. Let me give you an example. Okay, I'm not a prophet, right? I can teach pretty good, uh, uh, but I, I don't do that because, uh, you know, it's, it's a grace that's on my life, but I'm not a prophet. But uh, I say that to say I, I was invited to a home and in this home, they were having, uh, uh, I got invited because they were having gumbo. <laughs> so, sure, I'll come, I want to I have some good gumbo. And uh, while they were there, there was going to be a person that was teaching. So I walk into this home, have some gumbo, and I realize what I'm, while I'm there, it's almost like the, the heavens were open. It's like I had all these, these incredible prophetic thoughts i could see things i could hear things i, I mean it wasn't like like woo i mean it's like i could it's like it's like there was clarity in the spirit i'm going this is so weird uh, what's going on here well we sit down to have the bible study and i realized and this guy didn't say hey i'm prophet so and so he's just a teacher he's just teaching the word of god but i realized that this guy was a fivefold prophet and when he showed up guess what it made possible for other people to do prophesy right it was just a gift that he had. It wasn't supposed to keep it to himself, but it created an atmosphere where other people could also uh, do that. And in doing that, probably also served to activate the people around them into that same kind of gifting, right? Not everybody's going to be a prophet, but we can all prophesy as the Spirit wills, as the Spirit leads. Are you understanding what I'm saying? So what I'm trying to get you to understand is that there are still uh, grace gifts, one of which is a prophet, for what reason? To equip the saints to do what they do. What is it that they do? What is the function of New Testament prophets? Remember, looking back at the text in Jeremiah, we have seen that a prophet's calling included prophesying, but it also includes intercession. In the New Testament, I contend that the prophetic office is still called to do the same. The prophetic office is to declare the words that the Spirit is saying. It has another function to equip the saints to to perceive and to be able to see and hear and function spiritually, but also to intercede on behalf of the people of God. Intercession is a big part of what it means to be a prophetic people. Even the Old Testament, and when, of course, when I think people say, well, the Old Testament, that's just for yesterday. No, the Old Testament is the only Bible that they had in the New Testament times, and, and the time that the, that the scriptures were written is the only scriptures that they had. It's still scripture for today. You learn the will of God, not just in the New Testament, but you learn the will of God from the Old Testament because it's the same God. And I hope you see that when we're talking about the province of the Old Testament is that it's the same God still trying to work in the same way with his people, only now we're under a better covenant. And in this better covenant, if there was grace in the old covenant, how much more should there be grace in the new covenant? If there was intercession for the people in the old covenant, how much more should there be intercession in the new covenant? Right? I contend that the prophetic office is still called to do the same. The prophetic office is to declare the words the Spirit is saying, but also to intercede on behalf of the people of God. The, people, the very people that oftentimes people that have a prophetic gift are sent to declare the words of God to. Many today who are claiming, and this is my only personal opinion, many today who are claiming to be in the prophetic office or who will label prophets are declaring the word of God that they believe is given to them to give to us. Usually, revelation is hard to miss. God gives you a dream, hard to mess that up, right? God gives you a, a, uh, um, you know, a word, it's hard to mess that up, right? The revelation itself is hard to mess up. However, it's never just the revelation itself. There's also, with every prophetic word, there's revelation, interpretation, and application. Your filter 
oftentimes will determine how you interpret and how you apply what God is showing you, right? And if your filter is your model of what prophecy is, is an Old Testament prophet without understanding that even Old Testament prophets were supposed to intercede for the people, then you're going to come off as somebody that, that God has sent and your model of a prophet is somebody that goes and brings and calls about and brings judgment on people. Right? Now, it may be that if we don't change our ways, this is going to happen. That's true. It's possible. But a lot of these people that are declaring prophetic words of what they're getting, what they fall short in is they never say, let's pray that this doesn't happen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, God may show you, hey, it's possible that, um, you know, the stock market's going to crash or, uh, you know, um, because of, of so-and-so, uh, you know, California, let's just use that, California's going to fall into the ocean. And, you know, you just got people, God told me California's going to fall into the ocean. He told me that's it. And I'm just going to sit like Jonah and wait for California to fall. Right? How many people do that today? Now, listen, I'm not bringing or casting judgment on anybody. I'm just saying, scripturally, if that is what God is showing you, then if we're growing in God, and we not only have the words of God, but we have the heart of God, there has to be more than just, this is what God told me, therefore I just wait, and if I'm a prophet, it's going to happen. If it's not a prophet, if it doesn't happen, I'm not. No, there has to be an intercession on behalf of, of, of that prophet, and teaching the people to do the same. Let's Go to bat with God. Let's intercede with God and let's pray that none of this will happen. The problem is, if you pray that this doesn't happen, it doesn't happen, then I look like I'm not a prophet. I would rather look like I'm not a prophet and have God's heart revealed, which is that no one would perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of him. God doesn't want to bring judgment. God doesn't want to bring destruction. How can you say that? That's why he sent Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, will God, have you ever as a parent say, you better not do that because if you do that, you're going to feel my wrath. Have you ever done that? I've done that with my kids, right? Do I want to do that? Absolutely not. Is that really where I want to go? No. If my kids say, I'm sorry, you know, then you know what? That's great. That's what I want. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to discipline you. I don't want to have to do this in your life. That's not what I want. What I want is for you to respond to what I'm saying. And, 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 and oftentimes as a dad, I will say, please don't do that. I don't want to, 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 to spank you. I don't want to correct you. Please don't make me do that. It's not my heart, right? But I love you enough that if you don't correct your behavior, then I need to intervene. But I don't want to do that. If you'll just respond to what I'm telling you and, I, and respond to my interceding with you and for you, then I don't have to do what I don't want to do. And that's if we understand the heart of God and we understand what real prophetic ministry is, we might hear something. We're not saying that it's not from God. But if we do hear that, we need to recognize that God's heart in revealing that is not to do it, but oftentimes is that we would repent, that we would change, we would intercede, we would begin to do what we need to do so that God doesn't have to do that because of, uh, of our, uh, what we reap, what we sow. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So a lot of times, if you go back and if you just look at Scripture, uh, God was able to bring what he really wanted to bring into the situation, which is mercy and grace, because Abraham prayed, and Lot and his family were delivered from destruction. Moses prayed, and the people that God wanted to wipe out completely and start over again with Moses, God said, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll listen to what you're saying. You know, God was able to do that. And then, and we see what he did with Jonah. I think it's in the book of, uh, I think it's the book of Amos, where God shows Amos. Is that where, where it says, for three sins and then for four? I think it's Amos. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Amos said no. And all of a sudden, God says, because you, uh, okay, because you interceded, I'm not going to do that. Is it Amos where he saw the plumb line? 
I think it's the book of Amos. It might be, the, it might be another of the, of the minor prophets. But either way, what they're doing is they're praying and they're interceding, right? And so if that's what was happening in the Old Testament, how much more in the New Testament should we be a people that is interceding for the people around us, interceding for the world, interceding that a lot of the things that people are seeing would not happen, right? So I'm unwilling to say that people that are seeing some of these things are not necessarily prophetic people. I'm, I, I will agree that that's probably what they're seeing is probably correct. But a lot of prophetic ministry today, and, and, and I'm probably going to include myself in there because I'm not where I need to be prophetically, but I'm saying a lot of prophetic ministry today, if I was going to label it, I would label it as immature. we got to grow up. And what does it mean to be a mature prophet? It's Jesus, who is willing to give his life so that others may live, who is willing to become an intercession on behalf of people through his life, so that others could be spared destruction. So if we see something, we don't just say, let it happen. Imagine if Jesus was in heaven and he just said, this, they, pay, they, they did it, they sowed it, just let it happen. But that's not what he did, right? So if we see something um, of somebody that is growing into the image and likeness of God that is becoming more like Christ, should when they see that, should not only rally themselves to intercede, but also rally the body and teach the body that this is not the way it has to be. Let's change, let's pray, let's intercede that what I saw or what I believe the Lord showed me will not and would not happen. And you know what? I believe God is ever open to hear our prayers, right? Now, how many of y'all heard the story I told you about the hurricane coming, right? Hurricane was coming, barreling down uh, for this, this place, and I'm not the only one that prayed. I'm probably not the only one that God answered in the same exact way. Many people were interceding, but I began to pray. I said, God, don't let this come here. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, because you asked me, I'm turning that hurricane away. Right? Why would he respond that way if he wanted the hurricane to come and to cause damage? What he, was, what he really wanted is he wanted somebody that would stand up and say, no, Lord. Then the Bible says in Ezekiel 22 and 30, it says, I look for someone to stand in the gap, to stand in intercession so that what, what, what the things that are coming would not happen. Unfortunately, I could not find anyone. May it, may it never be that with us that God would ever be able to say, I look for someone to stand in the gap, but I couldn't find anybody. May he always find someone in our midst that will say no God please don't do this please have mercy please don't let this and God would say to us because you prayed because you asked me I'm gonna relent of this and I'm not gonna let this happen right now I'm not asking you to say hey pastor you know what you're absolutely correct just hear my words go back and study the Bible for yourself go back and read what it says and hopefully you'll come to the same conclusion a lot of these people that are saying hey the tribulation is on its way we just need to embrace and we just need to prepare for it I'm not saying the tribulation isn't part of what we're going to go through but you don't have to go through the great tribulation if uh, you know uh, here's what I'm saying don't 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 let me, let me finish this. You don't just have to submit yourself to go through the great tribulation because somebody said the great tribulation is coming. No, our heart should be, no, God. A lot of us are going, yes, God, get me out of here. Well, what if your children aren't ready? What if your neighbors aren't ready? What if your loved ones aren't ready? What if your uh, uh, neighborhood's not ready? Shouldn't we say, God, no. Not yet. Give us more time. Give us opportunity to reach them for God. Yes, I want you to come back, Lord. Yes, I'm ready for you to come back. But God, so many people would be lost if this happened. And so God, I am interceding. I am praying that God not yet give us time to reach my loved ones. Give me time to reach my children. Give me time to reach my family members. Give me time to reach this neighborhood. Give me time to reach this city. Give us time, Lord, so that we can reach them. Have mercy oh God could it be or just might be that God is saying because you asked me I'm going to relent 
and I'm going to give more time.